venture through this chapter. Lord, uh, may your Holy Spirit just fall upon each of us, soften our hearts to receive it, those areas in our life that maybe we're fallen short, or those areas in our life that where, we, where there needs to be a reconciliation with relationships, Lord, that, uh, Lord, you would just do that work. And uh, so we just thank you, Lord, again. Lord, you are faithful, so faithful to us. Lord, you love us with an everlasting love, and uh, you allow, uh, again, difficulties in our life that we might uh, know you and, and uh, draw closer to you. So bless this time, Lord, as we get into your word, in your precious name. Amen. Sorry, pardon me. <clears throat> ah, still am not getting used, used to the, uh, after first service, my voice doesn't want to do what it needs to do. Apparently it's wore out, but... Last week, we, we were in 2 Samuel 15, and we got through, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> fifth, uh, got through nine full verses. Took us all of 45 minutes, amazing, but it was good. And we talked about divisiveness and how seeds of bitterness can be bred, and, and, and really Absalom's divisiveness was a result of a strained relationship with his dad. And we looked at that, you know, as he was in Gesher for three years, away from dad, uh, on the run, came back to, to Jerusalem for two years, didn't see his dad's face. And so that strained relationship began to water the seeds of bitterness in his life. And we, today we're going to see that kind of begin to play out. You know, uh, Absalom's plan is going to come to fruition. And uh, right off the bat, though, we're going to look at some poor parenting and what we can really glean from that. David's example here and and, and so we're reminded in verse 7, Absalom says, please let me go to Hebron and pay a vow which I made to the Lord. And in verse 8, he says, then I will serve the Lord. And, and so, you know, Absalom's hope, again, was in appearance that he would look spiritual and that he would, you know, uh, kind of pull the wool over his dad's eyes, that, that David wouldn't see what he was really, truly behind the scenes trying to do. And, and we looked at that deception, and really that's what it was. It was deceitfulness at work and his cunning attempt to really deceive David and overthrow the, the kingdom. And so for David, this wasn't hard to believe. And we kind of g- talked a little bit about that. You know, as a parent, I will tell you, um, scripture, there's many scriptures that speak to me in that. You know, I think of John's scripture where he says that, um, you know, no greater hope do I have than to know that my children walk in truth. And, and, and how, as parents, we, we oftentimes have that tendency. We're so willing to believe our, our kids, uh, you know, concerning, you know, things. It, it, even when there's this least indication of, of, you know, some deceitfulness in their, in their ways, we're just, we grasp on to that which is, gives us hope. And, and rightly so, and I, I'm reminded in, in, you know, of love. You know, it, to me, it is, a, it is at heart, it's love as a parent. We, we see that in our kids. But in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, it says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And I think that, you know, when we look at that type of love, that's the love of our, our Father in heaven, who goes to the depth of those things, who never really wants to believe in us is, is that tendency. Even though he knows it's there, he knows our sinful nature, but he believes all things. And that's the type of love a parent has for a child. You know, and I'm certain that sometimes in our desire uh, for our kids to do well, that we neglect to discipline. We, we, we cut a corner, we take a shortcut, we, we overlook some sinful behavior because we, we want to see the best in our kids. You know, I, I was convicted often as, as I, you know, we homeschooled our kids. And I remember one time distinctly that I caught uh, one of my kids cheating. And I was like, well, that little turkey, I'm going to get him. And then I started to think about it. I'm like, you know, really what he did really wasn't that bad. And, you know, the grade, he got, he got a, a decent grade, and he's really been working hard in this chapter. And I really kind of began to justify his actions, saying, you know, it really was okay. And, and the Lord convicted me really quickly. and said, look, what are, you, what are you doing? You know, you're, you're saying that what he did was okay, cheating. 
He, he cheated. He didn't earn that grade. And, and so, you know, I began to learn that oftentimes, <laughs> as a parent, we make those mistakes. You know, we, we, in the best interest of our kids, we become zealous for those things. And <clears throat> as a coach, I will tell you, I think that, that this is amplified. We see this, uh, you know, uh, initially I, I saw this in, um, like, when my son was like five, playing soccer, you know, and uh, we showed up, he was on the team. Me and another dad were the only dads that showed up. The coach never showed up. We ended up being the coaches. Luckily, he knew what he was doing. I was just kind of along for the ride. And, and uh, we had the fortunate enough, you know, at five, five six years old, they, they kind of run around a group. It just, it's kind of comical all the way to play soccer. It's, you know, everybody's in a group, kicking the ball, kicking each other. And, but yet we had this one player whose dad was a soccer genius and from the time he was two, kicked the ball. And so this kid could dribble and kick and score. And so we just give him the ball and he'd run down the field and score. And I remember this, this game that um, this kid was doing that. And then somewhere in the middle of the game, the opposing coach said that there's a rule that when you get to a certain points that you have to start removing players. I'm like, what? In what world do you remove players in a competition? But apparently that was some rule they put in place so that everybody would not feel hurt. They weren't doing well. So by the end of the game, we had three players on the field, this young man, another player, and a goalie against their opposing team. And we were still scoring goals. And, and so almost comical, but, you know, and, and come to find out, the opposing coach was the mother. And she was what I call the helicopter mom, soccer helicopter mom. And, and, she, and her intention was to make sure that her kid did well, that they truly believed that this was something that would build up their self-esteem, right? That they would be okay with that. And, and unfortunately, it's a reality in our culture, I think, today, that we see this coming where kids are entitled and, and in effect, they, they think that they have something that they deserve. And we've raised a culture in a, around us that that sees that, that they don't want to put in the hard work because someone's going to give me what I deserve, right? It, it, it's just going to take place, and there's a reward for participation. Um, and we know that all to be a lie. In reality, hard work does pay off, right? And, um, you know, everyone doesn't get a prize. As a baseball coach, I will tell you that a number of parents will come to me and say, why isn't my child getting playtime. And I, I simply say, that's not the world around us. It's not reality. You know, it's, it's a competition. You're competing, and <clears throat> it, is, it, it is the best player that goes on the field because they put the work in. Not that your child doesn't deserve to be maybe on the team and practice and get better and hone their skills and have those opportunities to enter in the game when it's appropriate, but we're not going to reward just everybody just because you're on the team. And, and you know, unfortunately, in our, our culture, I think we, we have begun to do that. We're seeing the consequences of this lesson we're teaching our kids today, that they can and, and will get um, what they want and deserve. Oftentimes, it's in the workplace. Uh, I will tell you, I've hired numerous employees in, the work, in my time as, at Costco as a manager, <clears throat> guys who just felt they, we were obligated to take care of their needs. Well, I was I was late because I, I literally wasn't feeling well. Well, you're late. Sorry, it's a late. Well, wait a minute. But that means I'm going to get a counseling notice. Well, that's probably because you have seven of those instances. And yes, now you're going to get a counseling notice and it's going to head this direction. And, and how often an employer has to deal with an employee like that because they have no commitment skills, no, no hard work ethic. And so we're learning that. And David, since I think part of his failure as a parent is something we can glean from here. And um, commitments and, and responsibilities are something kids just seem to toss to the side. Um, you know, we as parents have to make sure that there are boundaries, that we set those boundaries. And my dad very early on taught me this one. I remember <clears throat> when I was like 13 or 14, I went with some friends up to the lake and we were out late and we you know, came home you know, really late, like one or two in the morning. And I had a job to do in the morning um, at seven o'clock. And I got up at six and, you know, googly eyed and tired and wiped out and began to make the phone call. I can't make it. I am just too tired. And my dad stopped me in my footsteps and said, what are you doing? 
well, Dad, I didn't get home till two. And I, got, like, I think I got three hours sleep. I'm just wiped out. And he's like, you have a commitment. You're going to that job. You're going to finish that. And that's, that's the type of dad I had. You know, I, I think, thank the Lord that he, uh, he brought that kind of work ethic into my life. Um, he didn't come to the Lord till later in his life. And, and um, you know, praise the Lord that he did. But, you know, he taught me certain values that I, I still to this day remember. And I think that's important. You know, Matthew, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 37, but let your yes be yes and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So when we, you know, compromise, you know, there's not a middle ground. It's a yes, yes, or a no, no. You know, it's, it's of the enemy and, and we don't teach a lesson. And, and you know, I'm, I've, I've been weak in this area as a parent. You know, oftentimes, you know, I, I've, uh, it's been a lesson that's been hard learned. You know, and I think that I'm, I, I realize that, that I'm still growing. Hopefully you guys realize that, that none of us are done growing in the Lord. We're learning things that, that God has a purpose behind even parenting, you know. And, and, and so um, God kind of sets the standards for us. In Hebrews 12, 6 through 11, it says, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as it as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness." Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So we see God sets the standards. You know, he says, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens. You know, chastening is out of love. There's a purpose behind it. And, And love requires discipline for our kids. When we don't discipline a kid, our kids, we're not showing love. We're minimizing their sin. We're not giving them the opportunity to grow and learn that life lesson. And, you know, we have to, again, set standards. Um, be consistent. We can't be wa- waving, wavering on, on these kind of things. And the interesting part of this verse here, you know, he says that enduring chastening. And I had never thought of this, but I, you know, I thought, man, it, it, it must be hard for kids to endure chastening from their parents. You know, I, I think that growing up, when my dad would give me the belt or there would be a consequence, that was hard. But I had, I had really never thought of it from the perspective of a parent, that how difficult it is to actually parent when, when you have to endure the chastening of your own kids. And, and I truly believe that it's a hard thing to do, to be able to, to be a real parent. Biblically, you know, God, God has a perfect design for us in parenting. You know, his word lays it out for us. You know, when we oftentimes don't parent the way that God intends, we, we parent the way our parents parented. You know, we learn from them. And for me, you know, I learned that very on, early on that my dad was just, you know, he was the, the disciplinarian. You know, if I did something wrong, I was, it was an automatic consequence, whether it was a belt or a grounding or whatever it was. And so I never learned to parent in a loving manner. You know, I learned to just kind of be a disciplinarian, and oftentimes it was yelling or, you know, angry, angryness behind it. And, and, and yet, as I began to go through the discipleship program, I learned that God says, no, I love my kids. You know, I, I, I chasten them, and, and, and when he says discipline, discipline is better translated as training. It's a, it's a way of coming alongside your child and training them into the things that you, they need to learn, much like an athlete. You don't expect, you know, a five-year-old to begin to just get up and hit a baseball like it's no big deal. You know, you you go through the procedures of teaching them concepts, and and over time, they they become proficient at it. You know, it's 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 like athletics. You see that, and so parenting is is much like that. You know, there's discipline that needs to be given. You know, a, a boundary that's set. You break this rule, this is the consequence. And consequences can simply be. You know, you're going to go clean the bathroom. You're going to do the dishes. You know, it's when the, the child is not willing to accept 
the discipline that there needs to be some kind of motivation to say, look, uh, I'm doing this. And, and it still doesn't mean it's just a physical act and you're done with it. It's sitting down with that child and saying, hey, I love you so much that I know that if you continue this kind of behavior, this is where it's headed. So there's consequences to life. We're teaching you this and it's biblical. And so, <clears throat> again, I, I think that David's, you know, his lack of parenting skills teaches us things that we can glean. And it is difficult. It's hard. We have to endure that chastening as a parent. David seems almost uh, unable. He's struggling with that ability. Oftentimes he was, you know, overindulgent, and sometimes he was just really harsh on his kids. And, but we read in that, that Hebrews verse again that afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And, and I will tell you that when discipline is done right, over time, you see young men, young women who walk a, a walk with success, faith, lived out, that they're just a blessing to be around. And I know you guys have families that you've probably seen this witnessed in, families who, who got it figured out. And so there is that fruit of righteousness, right living before the Lord. And again, I, I, I think of David's situation here. I'm sure his heart strings were pulled to hear that his son wanted to go to Hebron and worship. Should he have seen the deceitfulness in it? Yes, he should have. He thought the best of his kids, and he, but he should have seen it because Hebron again was a place where kings were anointed, not where people worshiped. Jerusalem was a place of worship. And so that last verse there in nine, we see that David tells him to go in peace. As we jump into our study here, we begin to see this, this whole divisiveness kind of played out, and, and Absalom's going to raise himself up. And so verses 10 through 12, it says, Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom reigns in Hebron. And with Absalom went 200 men invited from Jerusalem, and they went along innocently and did not know anything. Then Absalom sent Ahithophel, the Gilanite, David's counsel from his city, from Gilo, where he offered sacrifices, and the conspiracy grew strong, for the people with Absalom continually increased in number. So true, true colors come out here. We see Absalom's deceitfulness. He, he's trying to make it look like it's this, some, this spontaneous you know, desire for the people to make him king. Look, I've got 200 people with me, but they're, they're innocent, it says, that they didn't know anything about it. And, and again, it's just him showing his true colors, the deceitfulness of his plan, and it's coming to fruition. On top of that, it says that he brings Ahithophel. Now, Ahithophel, we're going to learn quite a bit more about this guy in the next coming chapters, chapter 17 specifically. But for now, just know Ahithophel was Bathsheba's grandfather. And he was David's closest friend and counselor. And so what we see again here is the beginning of the fruits of bitterness. You know, the, those seeds that were planted in Ahithophel's heart Many years prior, as he saw Bathsheba was, was uh, taken from, with David and, and, and that D David killed his grandson, uh, Uriah. So the seeds of that bitterness now come into fruition here. And so he's going to join Absalom. Verse 13 says, Now a messenger came to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. And, and in reality, we have to understand that this isn't, some obscurity here, that evil men, even Satan himself, um, often wins the battles. And he will take hearts uh, of those, of, of, of people that love God. He will remove them from the Lord. He, he has the ability to do that, to manipulate us into believing a lie, you know, believing the divisiveness of a conversation, you know, and, and we have to, to confront these types of things head on. And for David, you know, he sees the, the, this thing come to fruition. Again, the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. And, and he, he had the opportunity so many times before to be a reconciler, right? Over those years, he had the opportunity and he neglected those things. And so they're going to come at him full speed here. Verse 14, so David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, arise and let us flee or we shall not escape from Absalom. Make haste to depart, lest he overtakes us suddenly and brings disaster upon us. 
and strike the city with the edge of the sword. You know, what's interesting is that David knows that this is an evil and a life and death situation and that his son was capable of those things. You know, that he realized, he came to the realization right here in this verse, you know, it, as he begins to see that Absalom's going to come and not only is he worried about what's going to happen to him, but he realizes, you know, the edge of the sword is going to come all, upon all of Israel if he stays around. And so he says, you know, we, we, we don't have any time to discuss this. There's no time for, for deliberation, negotiations. It's, it's time to flee. And, and we see that men like Absalom rarely stop until they achieve their desired uh, goal. And, and so we have to, again, I'm reminded how important it is for us to address the Absaloms in our life, those creating divisiveness amongst the body of Christ. You know, we, we have to see them as brothers and sisters in the Lord and in love approach them and let them know that, that this is a direction that if they continue that, that they cannot attend this body. It just can't continue to happen because we won't be a place where, where the sword is going to come and people are going to be divided. You know, a church, we're, we're to love one another, we're to be reconcilers. And so we're to do it in love, but we have to do it. So we see verse 15 through 18, we'll jump there. It says, and the king's servants said to the king, we are your servants, ready to do whatever my lord, the king commands. Then the king went out with all his household after him, but the king left 10 women, concubines to keep the house. And the king went out with all the people after him and stopped at the outskirts. Then all his servants passed before him and all the Cherethites and all the Pelethites and all the Gittites, 600 men who had followed him from Gath passed before the king. Uh, there is a resounding, uh, very de demonstrative word use here when we look at king. King seven times is stated here. And, and what we, we glean from that is, is that, you know, God, the Holy Spirit, who, who anointed the writer to do this, to, to write this, inspired the writer, is making it very clear that David is still king. And that it's not, you know, a matter of what Absalom is going to now begin to take on as his title. Man doesn't get to say, I am the king, uh, I'm the leader. You know, God is the one who places a man in authority. And we talked about that last week, you know, that, that God places men in authority above us. He's, he's sovereign in those things. Psalms 75, 6 through 7 says, For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one, and he exalts another. You know, I, I, I see this that, you know, again, it's the a, it's a sovereignty of God. That God is in control. And, and it's something that we've seen over and over again as David would go back to inquire of the Lord. You know, it's a lesson that I think all of us need to learn, especially when we think of divisiveness. You know, our trust is not in man, but is in the Lord. And when we place our trust in man, we're going to find, when we have a fear of man, that we're not going to fear God the way we should. You know, we have to have a right perspective of who God is. God is in control. And so, you know, David we see that the, the Holy Spirit, again, says, king, 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 seven times. David, you are the king, and God's not done with you yet. We do see a handful of faithful followers. You know, we see David's original 600 men from Gath. These are his mighty men. They're still faithful to him. And we see three groups of Gentiles, not Jews, but Gentiles. And we see all the Cherethites, all the Palethites, and all the Gittites. And, and you never know, I guess, who your true friends are right? Until you're in the midst of a battle, when you're in the midst of a trial in your life. And, and friends will be those who will step up faithful, the, the, that'll set aside things. And we see that with David here, these guys faithful to follow him. They, they have great discernment in knowing who David is and that God is still with him. Um, Proverbs 26 says, most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? So evidently, faithful men are rare indeed, right? Men who we can trust with things. And I'm, I'm blessed to know that as I, I stepped into this leadership role, that it's not just my lead, leadership that's running this place. I have faithful men that are so faithful 
You know, thank God that there's a body of Christ around me. It's the body of Christ. It's not just me. And I think that's, the, that's the, our desire, right? Here is that, is that we come and that Christ is our head. He's our headship. And the rest of us are just serving underneath him. You know, I'm, I'm an under rower like the rest of you. And I'm following the captain. And, and we have faithful guys in this body who are just faithful to, to serve. And, and I love that. It's, you know, it's, it's not, it's not in, in concurrence with their circumstances. They're, they're willing to lay aside their own circumstances and be servant-minded. And, and such is this next guy, Ittai. He's the Gittite. In verse 19 through 22, we read about him. It says, Then the king said to Ittai the Gittite, Why are you also going with us? Return and remain with the king. For you are a foreigner and also an exile from your own place. In fact, you came only yesterday. Should I make you wander up and down with us today since I go I know not where? Return and take your brethren back. Mercy and truth be with you. But Ittai answered the king and said, As the Lord lives and as my lord the king lives, surely in whatever place my lord the king shall be, whether in death or life, even there also your servant will be. So David said to Ittai, Go and cross over. And Ittai the Gittite and all his men and all the little ones who were with him crossed over. So the guy that was only with David for a day. In fact, you, were, you came only yesterday, David said. And, and it's such a short friendship. And yet this guy saw something in David. He looked beyond the outward appearance of a man. And I'm reminded in 1 Samuel 16, when David was chosen by God, that Samuel came to pick and anoint a king out of the household. And he went through all of them. And, oh, surely this one is one, right? He's tall and handsome and muscular. And God said, no. In verse 7 of, of that chapter, he said, you know, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And that's the discernment that we need to have. And I, I think this guy is a good example of that. He looks at David. He sees the intent of David's heart, that it's to serve the Lord. Not him serving himself, he's serving the people, he's serving the Lord, and such great discernment on his part. But an interesting comment here is that David tells Ittai, he says, return and remain with the king. And here we're getting a little glimpse into where David is at. I believe that he's starting to be a little depressed. You know, he's, he's ready to relinquish the kingdom. I think he's come to that point where he realizes in all of his sin in his life, that the consequences are now coming. God had definitely prophesied that, that because you did these things, you did them in the, the dark of the night, I'm going to do them out in the open. In the next chapter, we're going to see that, where Absalom is going to sleep with the concubines on the roof, out in the open. God's going to reveal his sin. And, and I think David's beginning to really struggle with those things. In chapter 16, we're also going to see Shimei, a guy that's cursing David. He, he's throwing rocks at him, kicking dust on him. And David says, leave him alone. Maybe the Lord has commanded him to curse me. You know, and he, so let him be, David said. He, feeling defeated. No doubt he's coming across this whole point in his life again. And now I'm on, on, run, on the run again, being pursued. You know, Saul 2.0, here comes Absalom. I'm on the run. And, and for David, it, I'm sure it was a sobering realization that no matter what, you know, there's always mercy and grace in God's kingdom, right? We can always come to the Lord, that God will grant us that, but there is also always a consequence to our sin. God will not alleviate those things. And so David is resigned again to give the kingdom, and we'll learn more about that as chapters come. Verse 23, 23 says, and all the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people crossed over. The king himself also crossed over the brick Kidron. And all the people crossed over toward the way of the wilderness. All the people wept. You know, I, I, it's amazing that, that David has this support behind him. And yet it would seem like a, a defeated process. That this is just going to be an end to me. And, and, and yet we see the people are weeping and and I think that's the case oftentimes when we see evil men in leadership who don't walk in submission to authority. You know, it grieves people to see that. And I, I think that, you know, as a, as a church body, I, I think of how that would look, you know, when, 
when somebody would not be submitted. And, it, and I've seen that played out in, in different ministries where there's somebody who just wants to rear their head up. They have an agenda. They're unsubmitted to somebody in leadership. And, and it grieves the people who are there serving. It makes everybody uncomfortable. They're afraid to address the issue. And so it, it grieves the people and they weep. And the, David mentions the, the Brook Kidron. And this is the first mention of the Brook Kidron that, that's mentioned in the Bible. And, and David crosses over it as he, as he head into the Mount of Olives in verse 32 here. And, and he worships there. And, and I, I'm reminded of the parallel to this, you know, the, the last time that this is used. In, in John 18, 1, it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. And so the last time that this reference is when our Lord and Savior crosses. And the, the, the picture to me is, as we know, as Jesus crossed, he, he, that brook was flown with blood red from the Passover. And, and the, the story that is told after that, you know, the, the, the in-depth part of his prayer on that mount of Olives as he sweat great drops of blood as he was to come off that mountain. And no doubt David is in that hardship as he heads to the mount, but he's there to worship the Lord. And again, I think he's, he's in a position of relinquishing control, not only to, to Absalom because he sees God's hand in it, but ultimately to God that his relinquishing is to trust in the Lord. In verses 24 through 30, we see a little insight from the priests. It says, There was Zadok also, and all the Levites with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God, and Abiathar went up until all the people had finished crossing over from the city. Then the king said to Zadok, Carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord... He will bring me back and show me both it and his dwelling place. But if he says thus, I have no delight in you. Here I am. Let him do to me as seems good to him. The king also said to Zadok the priest, Are you not a seer? Return to the city in peace and your two sons with you, Ahimaaz, uh, your son, and Jonathan, the son of Abiathar. See, I will wait in the plains of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. Therefore, Zadok and Abiathar carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem, and they remained there. So David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives and wept as he went up, and he had his head covered, and he went barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered their heads and went up weeping as they went up. So this is just a, a very tragic you know, scene as we see them going up on top of the Mount of Olives. A very depressed David and, and weeping over the situation but he's going to end up being up there to worship. And the interesting point is, is that the priesthood, they're loyal to David. Again, the discernment to see that God's hand was still upon David. And, and so their, their whole perspective was that where David was, the ark of God needed to be. But I love David's response in that he says, you know, if I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and show me both it and his dwelling place. And I think that's a, a, a good insight into David's mindset. That he's, again, he's relinquished to whatever the Lord. If the Lord be that I come back, then let it be. If not, he says, if not, uh, I ha he has no delight in me, then here I am. Let him, let him do as it seems good to him. And so he's trusting in the Lord. And so they take the ark back. And, and it says that David went up on the Mount of Olives leaping, or weeping. During this time, as he's in the wilderness, this, this fleeing time from Absalom, David pens six psalms. Psalms 3, 41, 55, and then 61 through 63. And they're all written during this time. I think Psalms 3 is the one that kind of stands out most to me as, a, as we read it. It says, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. As you think about how all of the people, David, you know, it's coming, words coming to him that all the people are with Absalom. He says, they have increased to trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there is no help for him in God. Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. Selah. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God. 
For you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Selah. And again, the heart here of David is his appeal that the Lord's will be done. Isn't that a good place to be? When we say, my circumstances don't matter. God, I'm just going to trust in you. I've seen you be faithful. I mean, you read that psalm and, Lord, you are my shield. You're a shield for me. How he, he protects me from my enemies. And David could say that throughout all his life. No matter what the consequences of his sin were, he could say that God was his shield. You know, and such a neat, neat psalm. I love the psalms for that because David pens these when he is in the worst place he could possibly be. He's on the run from his son of all places who wants to kill him. And, you know, and that speaks to me because in our troubles, as they increase, you know, things get difficult. Life is hard, right? There are good times, but there are definitely bad times. You know, Romans 8, 28 plays true that God works all things to good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God works them to good. He's faithful. And it speaks so much to me because I need that. I need to be able to cling to that in our life. Life isn't going to be all perfect. It just never will be. Not until we stand before the Lord. And, you know, and, and I'm reminded, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Amen. Right? And so that's, it's a beautiful place. And, and we see David there. Pastor Chuck comments on this. He says, the person who has true peace and contentment is a person who, total, who has totally yielded their lives to the will of God. And I, I, that's a huge reminder to me because oftentimes we complicate our Christian walk. You know, it's, it's about, you know, I got to go to church. I got to do this, do this, this, and this. And it, it becomes a have to. You have to do these things. And it's got to come out of a heart of, guess what? I get to do this. I get to, because God has been so merciful for me. I get to rest in God. Christ has finished everything. Everything. I don't have one sin that's held against me because Christ died for my sins. As far as the east is from the west. You know, though tomorrow, though tonight I will sin, you will sin, it's all paid for. So I get to, to serve the Lord. I get to open the word of God. I get to pray. I get to worship. And I love that when you can rest in that, that's, that's true peace. You're not striving in this world, right? God is, he's the sustainer of us. He will provide. And, and we just get it mixed up and complicated. It's supposed to be so simple, right? To love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength. Jesus put all the commandments into one. For we love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength. It's the only thing we have to do. And so it's a, it's a beautiful place for, for, for David to be. And we see that in verse 31 it says, Then someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O oh Lord, I pray, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. And so, again, I, I'm quite sure that Absalom would have been, you know, felt like he was unable to do this. Uh, Ahithophel had great wisdom. He, again, he was David's closest friend, his closest counselor. He had this great wisdom. He was looked upon as somebody with great wisdom. In 2 Samuel 16, 23, it says, Now the advice of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days, was as if one had inquired uh, at the oracle of God. So it was all the advice of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. So he was a wise man. He had all this intuition, and, and he, he guided David and even Absalom with great, thank, great decisions, and yet he was untrustworthy. And as we're going to see, his pridefulness is going to catch up to him. That bitterness in his heart is all going to catch up to him. As we see, David prays his prayer that his counsel would not be received. And in 2 Samuel 17, 23, it says, Now when Ahithophel saw that his advice was not followed, he saddled a donkey, and he arose, and he went home to his house, to his city. Then he put his household in order, and he hanged himself and died, and he was buried in his father's tomb. Tragic. We look at it, you know, but the truth is, you know, those who buy into divisiveness, and when we do that, it comes at a cost. He bought into it. He allowed the, the bitterness, so seeds of bitterness in his heart to just boil up rather than to reconcile with David. And, and you know, the fruit of it was very evident. It became fruit of the flesh again, and we'll see those things. 
I can't help but note here a parallel, though. You know, as, as David is betrayed by Ahithophel, his closest friend and, and confidant, the son of David, Jesus, was betrayed by Judas. And both of these men were hanged. They hanged themselves. And so, you know, the cost of this kind of betrayal and, and divisiveness, it has just, it goes way too further than we would ever expect. Last few verses. Now it happened when David had come to the top of the mountain where he worshiped God. He, there was Hushai, the archite, coming to meet him with his robe torn and dust on his head. And so David said to him, if you go on with me, then you will become a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I was your father's servant previously, so I will now also be your servant. Then you may defeat the council of Ahithophel for me. And do you not have Zadok and Abiathar, the priests, with you there? Therefore, it will be that whatever you hear from the king's house, you shall tell to Zadok and Abiathar, the priests. Indeed, they have there with them their two sons, Ahimaaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them, you shall send me everything you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, went into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. Interesting is that David... He went and worshiped God and, and as he got to the mountaintop. And, and what it shows me here is that true worship is not about us. It's not about how I feel at, at any specific time. It's not about even a style of worship or a music style. It's, but it's because God is worthy. You know, David gives God worship, not because God was doing anything important in his life at the time. You know, he was really in a hard spot in his life. But he worships God and he realizes that the mercy of God that, that exists in our life. You know, David, he had experienced God's mercy so often. And in Psalms 115, verse 1, it says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory, because of your mercy, because of your truth. That's where worship comes. That's true worship for us. We come to the Lord, we give him the glory because he is worthy of that. We see David uh, encounters Hushai. And he becomes a double agent. We see David becoming really world wise here. You know, he, he instills somebody on the inside that can tell him what's going on. And so he used some world wisdom here. And, and Jesus said in Matthew 10, 16, Behold, he says, I send you as, out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as, as doves. So David used some worldly wisdom here. And we see that played out. So Absalom comes into Jerusalem as Hushai comes back as well, and, and we're going to see in a couple of weeks, um, really, the, the seeds of divisiveness played out in Absalom's life. And as we go on into the further chapters, we're going to see the end of, of Absalom. But uh, in conclusion, you know, this, this chapter has been extremely difficult. You know, we see the ugliness that arises from bitterness. It's not pretty when we see a family ripped apart because of you know, an unreconciled relationship. Um, I think it's important for us that, that we understand the depth of divisiveness. Um, God has made it very clear here for us. And you know, the, the second underlying thing I think we see is the effects of poor parenting. You know, David, in his life, he had that stumbling block. You know, his lust for the flesh, his inability to really lead his kids and his family. And how important, you know, God's word is written for us that we glean these things. And, and I think out of all of this, you know, as a parent, I hope you're encouraged to, to begin the discipline process, to get into a discipleship class. You know, we're going to have a discipleship class again for the parenting in September. It, you know, whether you're a young parent, an old parent, a grandparent, you know, a parent to be someday, I encourage you to take that class. You know, none of us are equipped naturally to be parents, but it's a process in which God begins to and has in my life shown me that kids are the, are the tools, the resources that God uses to change us, right? And, and God wants us to have godly offspring, that they would walk in faith all the days of their life, and it begins with parenting. It's an investment that, that's so crucial, you know, and God, he has it in his word for that. And, you know, finally, the, the, the thing I, I'd leave you guys with is that God is in control. Amen. I we see that. Throughout the story of David, 
You know, we have to take home the fact that God is using David's life to show us that he is faithful even when we're unfaithful, right? And God loves us, that depth that he loves us. He, he grants us mercy, he grants us grace every day. And so even in the midst of dark times, know that God is there with you and he's gonna bring you through it. He's faithful. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you again for your word and Lord, just uh, reminded so much of David's life and how it reveals so much to us. Life lessons indeed, Lord, as we look at the scripture and there's so much to glean from, from life lessons. Lord, you, you desire that we would learn from those who have gone before us and not have the, the difficult lessons that, that, lie, that lie before us, Lord, the, our own mistakes. But we often choose that, Lord, and forgive us for that. But help us to, to glean, help us to hear your word today, this morning, Lord. Help us to not only just have it go in one ear and out the other, but just sink into our heart, Lord, that we apply your word, that we would be people that reconcile relationships, that we would be parents who love our kids and discipline them because we love them, Lord. And, and again, just, Lord, that we grow closer to you. I think that's really a, um, your desire, Lord, more than anything else, that we would love you. And uh, so just, Lord, again, thank you for this time. Would you bless these guys as they head out, Lord? Thank you for the opportunity to open your word. We're blessed by you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. Pray that uh, you have a blessed afternoon. Enjoy the cool weather. If you have a need for prayer, uh, Pastor Dell will be over here and would love to pray with you. Um, I know that life can be difficult and you need that refueling. So come on up for prayer. And other than that, God bless you guys. Have a great day.